mud, but it, it is what it is. But Katrin got the exemption despite competing two years in Europe and moving to a new section of the United States. And we weren't given a clear rule. It seems to be that, the, that it, there was some credit given in the past, but it was like you were given credit for something that happened before you already established residency and competed in Europe. So there was like a lot of vague there. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that you run into where athletes, I think people would have been fine if it was, if that rule was applied as written across the board. But when you can point to someone else and be like, as it's written, we were treated differently. That's where I think you get into trouble. Yeah, I, I, exactly. Right. And, you know, we don't know all the details of um, Catherine's case. Like, I don't I don't hold anything against her. No, no, for sure. Um, you know, if I was, you know, it's like she might have just two home addresses, right? Like two very physical home addresses. And I don't know. I just I literally don't know. But, yeah, like I, I think to, to circle back right to the beginning, you know, athlete associations in other sports, uh, you know, like in the NFL, like they'll uh, they'll have meetings about, you know, we want to change a rule. Right. And so we want to we want to have a specific rule change in regards to uh, protecting the quarterback or something like that. Right. We want to make sure our quarterbacks stay safe. And so the athlete association will have an opinion on that based on what the athletes want. And then, you know, maybe the organizations have a different opinion, the owners and the league, you know, that uh, are in their interest, whether it's, you know, we want it to be a more exciting game or, or whatever those things are. And then there's like a back and forth and there's an understanding of that. And so we want to make sure that the rules are good. And like I said, to the athletes we've spoken to, to the coaches, um, it's in the best interest of the athletes overall to just be based on where are you and just compete. And again, like the one place it would potentially negative impact, negatively impact are some of those developing areas, right? South Africa, or sorry, not South, South America, Africa, Asia, if, you know, an athlete of maybe a more experienced caliber from Europe or North America moved there. Um, but I think if you look at the totality of how it would positively or negatively affect the group of athletes and from a fairness perspective and an ease of applying the rules, I think it makes more sense to go back to what we had in 2011 to 2018, something closer to that. And then, you know, the other thing is, yeah, do we like the rules? And then are they being, are they being enforced consistently? And, you know, it's hard to say when we don't have every single detail yeah. right yeah yeah is this something that and i know when we reached out to crossfit they said that they weren't going to you know give more details or insight to the situation until the entire um like uh exemption process was over which i think isn't until february 28th i want to say like right before the open yep. have you or other people from the pfaa spoken with crossfit and uh, you know, had some kind kind of conversation about advancing or changing the rule. Not as much as we'd like. Um, we reached out to them. We talked about a few other rules. There was that one. You know, we we requested some more information, even regarding uh, the details for quarterfinals. Hmm. Right, like you know, how many workouts per window? Kind of what more like what those time windows will look like because it's changed a bit this year. And we felt like that information would, would help athletes prepare effectively and gyms prepare logistically and also allow CrossFit to make more money because the more details you have on that, you're more likely to get kind of some more community members involved. And their answer to that was, like, it's going to be what it's going to be. Um, we tried to provide them with some, some quality advice on how it could make them some more money and how it would be also positively impact athletes. We think it'd be a win-win. But um Maybe they're just not writing the workouts yet, and they don't want to commit to anything until their their workouts are done. But yeah, we haven't had um, as much meaningful conversation on the application of the rule, and you know, perhaps diving into what that would look like to change the rule as we'd like to have. Yeah, and hopefully some change can happen because I mean, if we follow in the footsteps of other sports, once the rule does change, usually the athlete who was the catalyst for that, unfortunately, your name gets tied to it because even if you don't get the benefit of it, like you know. Uh, the Calvin Johnson rule in the NFL around what constitutes a catch has been one of the most hotly contested rules in, in, in modern memory, at least. And heck, even in this sport, we have the rich Froning rule, which is the no dumping bars behind you. Um, and, and that was something that was implemented after 2014, which would have negated his famous final rep in double grace. But, uh, you know, sometimes the, those athletes don't get the benefit, even though they're tied to it. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, if there's anything off the top of your head, Brent, that you feel like needs to be addressed um, around these rules or, or what, what's coming down the pipe? 
Sorry, could you, could you ask that again? I say, is there anything else that we're leaving out as far as like these rules or, or details behind the scenes that the, the, the average person who maybe doesn't read the rule book is unaware of? If not, I mean, I just want to make sure we're covering all our bases. Yeah, no, I think it's pretty well covered. Hopefully everything I've said is uh, factually correct. Comment and uh, like if, if I missed something. Uh, <laughs> you know, prove, prove me wrong. I, I think everything I, I said was pretty factually correct in regards to the history of how you qualify as an individual and a team, which I think is important for context. And I think it's also important to compare to other sports. You know, um, like what kind of sport are we? What kind of sport do we want to be? And like, you know, for example, we didn't have the opening ceremonies, right? Uh, in, at the CrossFit Games up, the first time that it happened was 2019 and then we've had it ever since. So, you know, I think the, having the nation's, um, uh, athletes with a passport maybe has kind of emboldened that, um, you know, the, the opening ceremonies doesn't really do much for me. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, there's, miser. maybe there's other people. <laughs> I, again, like maybe, maybe the, maybe the fan, like I know at the Olympics, the opening ceremonies is a big deal, right? Um, athletes are stoked to do it and uh the fans are you know the, the, the stadium is packed to watch the opening ceremonies um you know but may, maybe that's again you know maybe they have a vision for where they want it to go but for me it's like if you're removing the masters and the teens all of a sudden that opening ceremony is just like not a lot of people to fill it up uh it's just 40 men 40 women and 30 or 40 teams the opening ceremonies all of a sudden just shrunk a lot. So it, it becomes a much smaller event, which to me more, you know, resembles like a PGA championship or something like that, where, Hey, this is the world championship of this privately owned sport. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I just don't think the national pride element of this sport is like a, it's going to be a driving factor of its growth in the future. It's really like creating opportunities to compete and, uh, you know, emboldening affiliates and kind of tying in maybe, you know, what the affiliates are doing to how athletes can, you know, be involved with their affiliate, but also involved in like competitions, both local and abroad. Uh, and, I think we pretty much covered it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and yeah. honestly, beat it, beat, it to, beat it to a dead ball. Hey, 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 <laughs> it's better than the alternative, but it, it, in, in the case of certain countries, because I know there, uh, this is the last comment I'll have. There are countries that are receiving national funding. Part of that has been built through the IF3 as well. Um, but I think it's all through the eye. Yeah, and well, some of this uh, they recognize functional fitness as as a as a sport that they can get because because of the eye. Yeah, three. so um, for sure, I don't, <laughs> which is great. I, I, I don't honestly, I don't think changing the rule for CrossFit would prevent that in the first place, anyway. So um, no, I don't yeah. think so. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and that, that's you know that's a great example of people. I don't, I admittedly don't know a ton about that, but I think in. Uh, Oh, what's, what's the country that's really crushing it? Norway. 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 Or yep. Norway. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so they, like the, just like, you know, the government of Canada funds the, you know, like hockey for, you know, youth hockey and they fund all sorts of sports, right? You can get funding for your team and for your travel. Like they're doing, Norway gets like it's a couple, I think it's a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so, you know, if you're a Norway athlete that competes in IF3 events and you go to CrossFit Inc. events or you go to Wadapalooza or whatever, you know, you're getting money for that travel. Some of your healthcare expenses are covered if you like have to get a surgery, um, you know, equipment, coaching, coaches, travel, like all this stuff is covered. And, you know, that's props to what the IF3 has been, you know, working really hard to create. And so they're kind of the shining light of what's maybe possible. And you can get some of that juicy government funding for sporting. Uh, <laughs> it's a really good thing. Like, you know, and then you're seeing it. Like, you're seeing it at Wadapalooza where some of those Scandinavian countries, it's like, oh, crap, they're coming. It's a new hotbed because they're able to focus more on training, right? They're mm -hmm. able to kind of focus more on training and the coaches get more experienced. And there's a there's a there's there's this intangible level of, like faith, right? And it's this like hope and faith and belief and, you know, it's like, oh, there's something there and there's like something for me here long term. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there'd be a group of athletes there that are striving to be the next, you know, um, whoever, like, you know, the athletes in that area. And, uh, you know, and I've seen the inverse in some ways happen, let's say in Canada, where especially during COVID, like kind of the local competition scene, scene in like CrossFit, style events throwdowns went down uh, just because you couldn't have them and so because of that in a lot of gyms there's like less people you know training with the goal of competing mm -hmm. you know and so you you know the more people you have training with the goal to compete and you know then you're going to have more people 
doing the thing and buying mm-hmm. shoes and signing up for the open and all that yeah. stuff. So, all the so, good things. Yeah. Yep. All the good things. <laughs> buying shoes. Oh, <laughs> speaking of which, tear. <laughs> As I say, we already got the big logo right across the chest. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's nothing I appreciate more than that. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I think like all the, everything's tied together, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I, you know, you just want more people given the opportunity to compete and compete against people of a similar skill level, right? And if that skill level becomes, you know, top of the world, then you should be in the best events. But, sure. um, yeah, I think creating more opportunities and in areas and in those developing areas and figuring out, like, you know, culturally and stuff, like how to make that happen as opposed to just making sure that someone with a passport from that area gets a ticket to the games, I don't think is a very nuanced approach that's going to have like a lasting impact. For sure. Well, we appreciate the discussion, Brent. Uh, Thank you as always for being willing to hop on and and shine some light on that because I know you're doing a ton of work and the PFA, even if it's, you maybe not where you want to be, you guys keep trudging forward and, and hopefully that's just the stepping stone to eventually get in there. So uh, thanks. Thanks again, as always. Um, Hopefully, training the rest of the day goes well with your Jello legs, but uh, and you get to. <laughs> they're better yeah, now. Okay, they're they're better <laughs> now. Yeah, the standing help. We're good. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, standing still for. <laughs> oh man! Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Brent. Thanks again to Brent. As always, appreciate his insight and research, and and like you said, he's always one of our most uh, well prepared uh, guests. And I thought he made some great points overall. Yeah, and it just was interesting to also go through what what the ruling used to be or what it used to look like, especially in the infancy of the Open and kind of the system that we get to up until the games, but also comparing it, comparing it to some other sports. And I am really curious, I would love to ask somebody from CrossFit if the goal is to have more of a system that looks like the Olympics or if another system could be more favorable to, of course, we want to talk about the the athletes and what is beneficial to them, but also what's beneficial to the sport and how can we see the sport grow over the next five, 10, 100 years from now? Yeah, and, and, and I did mention, um, and I meant to mention it during uh our interview with Brent, but there are national champions. I think they, some mm-hmm. people got them in the mail like two weeks ago. Uh, this yeah. some athletes were posting it. They got it just before the end of the year. So there is a national champion thing. I don't know how much it factors into the actual participatory act uh, aspect of the sport, or if that's something that's necessarily driving people uh, towards the open of the sport more frequently, but uh, it certainly is an interesting thought. And I think, yeah, the, some of the comparisons were, were pretty apt and, I don't know. I still kind of feel, I know in, uh, on death by earlier this week, if you haven't already go check it out, we talked about this. Um, I was leaning more towards kind of a hybrid model, um, Mm -hmm. and some aspect of being able to still do, you know, opening ceremonies or some, um, national representation to just get people supportive of that. Maybe, maybe there's a, an additional competition series that you could do that could be more nation focused. That would be, um, kind of scratch that itch and then I'll open up the, the, the doors to be a little bit more open like Brent goes. But I think I'm starting to, to, to shift a little bit. I think I'm starting to shift more towards like ease of use scenario yeah. um, after hearing Brent. Well, even when I think of the opening ceremony, I think I went in 2019 and I mean, I'm there on site. I easily could go to the opening ceremonies, but I truly think that was the only year that I went and watched um, I, I think that there's, sh- if we're going to have it, there should be more hype around it. There should be some kind of spectacle and reason that pulls people and draws them in as, Hey, this is the unofficial official star of the CrossFit games. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I think that if they can do, or if in that hybrid model, if they're able to do something that's more, and I've always said we should do a nation's cup where you take all the national champions from the early part, parts of the season and have a secondary parallel type event, individual individual or team um, wise to the games. That is kind of like that exposure piece, but not necessarily this, the main focus. So you saw people coming to the games and getting involved and more athletes competing, representing their countries. Um, and maybe that's separate from the games too, but I, I think there is a way to play into that. Um, but yeah, but as it stands, like, if we're all doing this just for the open opening ceremonies, it seems kind of um, a bit of a miss yeah. as far as like 
really honing on what's mo- most important in like like Brent said, creating organic growth and, and grassroots type movements in some of these developing countries. But mm-hmm. but yeah, and, and I'm sure, like you said, uh, we're going to get more uh, insight to it from CrossFit side as they finish up that process. And once they finish all the exemptions, hopefully they provide us with the full scope of information, which um, they've been communicative about it with us uh, along the way. Yeah. So um, I'd be interested to get their take more too once, once we have final words. So um, yeah, but um, as, as I, we always mention, we don't have community support for today, but if there is you do have something be sure to share it um hit us up on social media uh let us know what's going on we always want to uh support the things that are going on in the space and uh hopefully lend a helping hand um and send that to both our personal and uh tef instagram accounts as well uh anything else before we sign off what are you up to this weekend i'm actually going to florida for a couple days to visit my brother with my family Nice. Hopefully yeah, better so weather. Ring in- uh, yeah, it's like a high of 73, so not like super warm, but I mean, right now at my house, actually, it's 54 today, so <laughs> it's nice. a relatively nice day in Syracuse. That's funny because it's 55 here, and, and I'm like, it's a cold day today. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't even need a jacket to go outside, but... Yeah, so going to celebrate the Super Bowl at my brother and sister-in-law's house. And, you know, we all have our Taylor Swift gear, so we are ready. Oh, okay. So, yeah, (laughs) all right. What are you going to tip up to? Uh, We will be going watching Super Bowl with some friends. Um, uh, It's tough because I I want, obviously, I want my wife to be happy. But she's a Niners fan, so I kind of don't in this scenario. <laughs> so you can't be. <laughs> so, because uh, I don't want the Niners to win. Um, but, yeah, it, it should be fun either way. I think uh, there, there was, like, so many, and, and this is totally an aside, but in 2019, the lead-in Super Bowl to the election was uh, uh, Kansas City Chiefs Niners. In 2023-2024, mm-hmm. 2023, uh, the lead-in Super Bowl to the election is Chiefs Niners. Isn't that funny how history repeats itself? Oh, that is really weird. I, I heard this stat from Chris Berman. He said it happened one other time with the Browns and the Rams, I believe, in the 50s, where this, uh, the same two P, uh, presidential candidates squared off and the same two uh, teams squared off in the Super Bowl both those years. So kind of crazy. That yeah. is. That's a good stat. Yeah. This is fun. This is yeah. One of those weird, uh, it's like, okay, what are you going to do with that stat? I don't know. I just wasted <laughs> an hour thinking about that. So that that's what goes on inside my head. Um, well, uh, I know you got to run, Lauren. So uh, have a great time in Florida. Um, are you going to play some pickleball? You know, I think I'm going to spend more time getting buried by my nephew in the sand, but. <laughs> a noble pursuit. Well, uh, yep. <laughs> Well, at least but for our Patreons, I will be live on Q and A close to the beach. So, oh, now it's, yeah, maybe we'll get some like pickleball in the background or something. It's not quite me making popcorn balls, but it'll do. Um, I know, I know, I can't keep up with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, uh, safe travels. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. Um, uh, thanks everyone for for listening and tuning in, and thanks again uh, for Brent Fakowski for mm-hmm. taking the time out of his day in between training sessions to come. Uh, shine some light on that so for for everyone at home uh, and this i'll end it the same way i did last time in honor of sean who will be back next week uh take care of each other be better and we'll talk to you guys soon you are listening to hit play not pause a feisty menopause podcast for active performance-minded women I am your host, Celine Yeager. Each week, I bring you advice from athletes, scientists, researchers, and other experts to help you feel and perform your best, no matter what your hormones are doing. This show is a production of Live Feisty Media. Hello, strong, feisty women. So I have a fun one for you this week. I had the opportunity and the pleasure to sit down with the one and only Myrna Valerio, a.k.a. the Myrnavator. And it did not disappoint. For those who don't know Myrna, she has been breaking ground in the endurance sports world since 2008 when she started her blog, Fat Girl Running, a 